Austin Nielsen, and I am Sound Transit's South Corridor Government and Community Relations Officer. Uh, I work with Chelsea Levy, who I know has uh, briefed the council in the past regarding our federal Waylink extension project, uh, which EJ just referred to. Uh, I'm here today to help uh, tee up our Tacoma Dome Link extension project and the partnering agreement that we've been uh, working on with city staff. Uh, just for a reference point, uh, many of you will remember the federal Waylink extension process. Uh, to put some context, we are at with Tacoma Dome link today uh, we are at where federal way link extension was six years ago so we just started work on this project earlier this year uh, with the planning phase and we'll be working very closely uh, with the city and the community and the council uh, as we pr pr go through that process uh, but I want to just start with a very quick overview uh, some, many of you will be familiar with this. Uh, just to context of what Sound Transit is working on in our district, uh, the Sound Transit district is over 1,080 square miles uh, scan spanning the urban areas of Snohomish King and Pierce counties. Uh, we have within our district 40% of the state's population, and we offer our three types of service, our Link Light Rail, which we'll talk about this evening, our ST Express bus service, and our Sounder commuter rail. Uh, we are governed by our 18-member board of elected officials from across the Central Puget Sound, as well as the Secretary of the Washington State Department of Transportation. And I believe that as the Council uh, can, experience, can attest to its firsthand experience, our region is continuing to experience rapid population growth. Uh, and according to recent uh, estimates by PSRC, uh, it's expected to have 800,000 more people in, within the Sound Transit District by the year 2040. And put that in the context, that would be the current populations of Seattle and Tacoma combined, layered on top of what we already experience. Uh, it's an average of 1,500 new neighbors a week and over 150 cars a day uh, on I-5, adding to the congestion issues. And as uh, Sue Comas and I can attest to having to sit in traffic down from Seattle with an accident uh, when it takes over 90 minutes just to get the, the 25 miles or so from downtown Seattle to Federal Way, uh, presents a lot of challenges for commuters and residents across our region. Uh, and as we are we're all aware of, uh, Sound Trend is working on our system expansion plan, uh, which the Federal Way Link Extension is a part of, of a overall effort between ST2 and ST3 uh, for a 116 mile expansion of our regional system, uh, which will bring online 49 new light rail stations across the Sound Transit District uh, that will connect uh, Tacoma uh, to Seattle, north to Everett, uh, out east to Bellevue, Redmond, and Issaquah over the next 25 years. Uh, we are also working to extend our Tacoma link service in the city of Tacoma uh, to the Hilltop neighborhood and Tacoma Community College. Uh, we'll be working in the years ahead to expand our Sounder commuter rail service uh, by more than 40%, uh, as well as our ST Express and bus rapid transit service uh, along SR 522, uh, 518, and uh, Interstate 405. Uh, but we're here tonight to really focus in on the Tacoma Dome Link Extension Project, uh, which as EJ mentioned, uh, where the Federal Way Link Extension, the finish line with that will be uh, the Federal Way Transit Center uh, just south of South 320th, will be the starting line for this project uh, for Tacoma Dome Link that will take a uh, regional light rail through South Federal Way and down to Tacoma. Uh, I'd like to introduce Sue Comas, uh, who is one of the project managers for our project team, to talk a little more about that project and the partnering agreement that you'll be considering later this evening. Thank you. Thanks, Austin, and um, good evening, everyone, um, mayor and council members. Yes, I am Sue Comas, and I am the High Capacity Transit Development Manager, which means I'm the planning lead on the project and project development lead. Let's see if I am not quite 100% sure on how to move the slide. Okay, there we go. Thanks. Okay, here we are. So um, this project is part of the ST3 plan. And that was adopted by the Sound Transit Board of Directors in June of 2016 and approved and funded by the voters in November of that year. So the project that we're focused on tonight is a federal way to Tacoma. And um, we have developed as part of that ST3 plan a representative project that established the project scope and the cost estimates for the project that was um, then included in the plan approved by the voters. So that representative project determined the uh, transit mode, which of course is light rail, and it defined the general corridor uh, for the route, 
the number of stations and the station locations. And as shown in the slide here, um, the representative project alignment, let's see if I can get this, go, uh, goes along the west side of I-5 um, down to Tacoma. So we plan to start with that representative project, but we are also in the process of investigating what other reasonable alternatives should be evaluated in our process. And for example, the exact route location is still to be determined. So a little bit more about the project itself. Um, it starts, as we mentioned, at the Federal Way Transit Center and ends at Tacoma Dome Station. It's about 9.7 miles, and there are uh, four stations, and the station locations are shown here. So the first one's at South Federal Way, and that's the, uh, that'll be the second station then in Federal Way um, with a parking garage. The next station's in Fife. It also has a par parking garage, and then there'll be a station in East Tacoma and another, of course, final station at Tacoma Dome. And the costs are also listed there along with a projection on the expected number of riders on the project. We also have an operations and maintenance facility, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in the South Corridor. So um, I spend just a few minutes on this because uh, most people are somewhat familiar, and you may be familiar if you've ever um, ridden from uh, the Angle Lake Link light rail station up to into Seattle and the uh, University of Washington. You may be familiar with the tracks and the stations, but a lot of people don't kind of think about something that's in the background, which is the maintenance facility. So all of the link trains have to be cleaned and stored every night, and they're regularly pulled out of service for routine maintenance. And that lists our maintenance window there from 1 a.m to 5 a.m. Those are the only times the trains don't run, so we run from 5 a.m. to 1 a.m. every day, and so we just have four hours out of the day to actually maintain the train. So it's a very um, intensive and uh, somewhat tricky operation. So um, we need to run the whole system that um, Austin described to you. We actually need four maintenance facilities. And right now we have a maintenance facility in operation in Seattle. It's called the Central Maintenance Facility. And there's one under construction in the east, and that's in Bellevue. And that's a, um, that'll be done to support um, the east and north portions of the, the line that are coming online. And then there'll be one, two new ones as part of the ST3, one in the north and one in the south. So the one in the south um, obviously is the, the one that's part of this project. And so it will be located somewhere between the Angle Lake Station and Tacoma. And as mentioned, the central uh, maintenance facility right now has about uh, 370 people employed at it. So it's, it's a pretty large employer. We have not identified a specific site yet. But this um, will need to be part of the project in order to extend to South King and Pierce County and serve the system as a whole. So this is just a, a photograph just to give, again, people an idea of what it looks like, a photograph of the existing central maintenance facility uh, in Seattle. So this is our timeline, um, not as exciting a, of a picture, I'd say, but um, there's a lot of information on there. So just to take a few minutes um, to talk to you about that. Our goal for um, starting service is 2030. Um, and we have a number of steps along the way. We're in the planning phase right now. And so the key milestones, um, the very first thing that we're doing is the alternatives development, as I mentioned. And one of the key milestones is uh, developing a preferred alternative. And we are looking to our board of directors to select a preferred alternative by June of next year. And then we will go into the environmental impact statement process and uh, finish that up with a record of decision on the project to be built by the year 2022. 
So that record of decision, sometimes called a ROD, um, determines the project to be built and how we will mitigate any potential impacts. And at that point in time, we'll have a firmer idea of our cost estimate. Then we'll be done with what we call the planning phase and we'll go into to the design phase. And that's uh, 2022 to 2025. Um, and that's where we would finalize any last details about the route alignment and the station design details. About in the middle of the design phase is when we will really nail down for certain the final cost and schedule for the project. And then in, we're uh, looking at starting construction in 2025. And of course people will, I'm sure, be very excited to see that happen and it'll become very real to people at that point. So again, we are now at the stage, this very early stage where we're investigating the alternatives. So now I wanna talk a little bit about our new approach to project development as part of ST3. So um, one of the things uh, as we were uh, working on the ST3 plan, we heard from people, public feedback, to try to uh, deliver these projects as fast as possible. So looking at that, we wanna both streamline the projects and build a high quality project. So we developed this system expansion implementation plan and that shows a, a picture of it, uh, the cover of it. And basically it is proposing new ways of organizing ourselves internally in Sound Transit and working with our stakeholders and partners. And that's what you're gonna hear a lot of, about tonight. And that's really with the goal of improving the, the timeline and the delivery. So the action that's in front of you tonight is the partnering agreement between the city and Sound Transit. Um, our goal is, uh, is to have partnering agreements between each of our four cities on this project as well as the Puyallup Tribe. And these agreements um, will give us a common understanding of the roles, responsibilities, schedule and budget imperatives so that we can uh, deliver the project in a timely manner. So the partnering agreement is to provide clarity and predictability on our expectations as we go through throughout the project, like all the way from now and project development through construction. So some of the key elements are listed up here, um, an agreement on the community engagement process that we'll tell you a little more about, commitments on the environmental review process, trying to streamline the permit review um, as needed, we'll be obviously investigating that in, in the years ahead and uh, coming up with a designated uh, point of contact on both sides. So the, this again lists um, more, a little more detail of some of the contents in the partnering agreement. Um, it's quite comprehensive. It's, uh, as I mentioned, meant, meant to last throughout the project. But we do assume that there may be the need for future agreements. Um, as time goes on on specific issues between Sound Transit and the city. And for example, the staffing is another one that we'll be looking at trying to do fairly soon so that if there is a special staffing that's needed to support the project, Sound Transit can assist with that. So again, uh, some of the key points are highlighted here. Basically, um, we include in the agreement an explanation of the scope, schedule, and budget, a definition of the project. Um, we coordinate with the city on planned projects uh, that the city might be doing in the same area as the Tacoma Dome Link project, and I already talked about the staffing. So that's kind of the partnering agreement and sort of what, what we hope to get uh, approval for from you tonight. With that, I will let um, Austin touch <clears throat> a little bit on community engagement. Uh, I think uh, Councilmember Duke will have maybe have a quick oh, question. I'm sorry. Yeah, since I think you're the person that um, I talked to before, sure. it's just a concern that I have. Um, when you, you're going to be relocating businesses and everything to to follow the line that the, that the right. uh, transit's going to go through, and um, I know you're going to pay them to relocate, but there's no right. guarantee they'll relocate here in the city or they'll even keep their business open. Is there any thought on mitigating the financial damage to the city? Well, uh, you know, as we talked earlier, and you know, we do have the relocation assistance and we would be very interested in working with the city and um, 
trying to see if there are, I mean, it is the business's choice what they do, obviously. But um, clearly there are ways that they can be assisted that um, might encourage them to stay within the city. Um, and that's something we can certainly, um, if you're specifically talking about the Federal Way Link Extension, which, has, which we know the businesses, um, some will be displaced, we will definitely pass that on and we'll get back to you on that so that we can we can see what can be done to assist them in in staying within the city. I mean, I think many, it depends on the business model, obviously. Many of them may really have a desire to live in the city and, and may need some help in uh, finding an appropriate site. So I will certainly take that back. We are always interested in working very closely with the city and, and your staff to, to make Yeah, I, I know you said that. I wanted it on the official record. Though. I know, and I, <laughs> I, I'm glad that you clued me in to say that. <laughs> You're welcome. All right, Austin. Thank you, Sue. And as alluded to earlier, uh, with our new uh, plan for system expansion with Sound Transit 3, you know, we heard from across the region that uh, it is a priority of the public to deliver these projects as quickly as possible. Uh, with Sound Transit's experience now with projects through the Sound Move package and ST2 uh, going into ST3, uh, the agency has a lot of lessons learned that we can apply to try to improve our project delivery process and make sure we are working collaboratively with the public and with the communities so we can be engaged uh, throughout the lifetime, life, lifetime of the project. Uh, and to do that, we've come up with a new community engagement strategy as part of our system expansion plan that I'd like to just share uh, some details with this evening. Uh, as you'll see, we'll start with a lot of these icons. We're going to start in the upper left with community updates. Uh, throughout the lifetime of this project, and especially in the next uh, year or so, as Sue alerted to, as we work on developing a path to a preferred alternative, uh, we will be working very closely with the general public uh, with a constant contact through uh, email hotlines, a project web page, uh, but also through open houses. Uh, we just concluded a series of public open houses, one of which was in Federal Way last month. I, I know several of you had the opportunity to attend. We greatly appreciated that. Uh, so we can gather community feedback and also answer questions. But throughout this part phase of the project and the entire project lifespan, uh, there will be many opportunities for the uh, public to engage and give their feedback. Uh, we also have a stakeholder group, uh, which will serve as a focus group uh, of business leaders, residents uh, from across all of the communities and representatives of the Puyallup tribal community uh, to give uh, some information and just as in and uh, feedback on uh, what are some of the trade-offs as we consider various alternatives or station locations uh, so we can get kind of an on-the-ground perspective? Uh, we've also uh, started a series of station workshops uh, for each of our station areas in South Federal Way, Fife, and both of the Tacoma stations uh, that really try to get more uh, in-depth to air impacted businesses, uh, residents that are in those communities in the immediate area of those stations uh, to give feedback on what they'd like to see in station design, location, uh, opportunities for development around the station. Uh, we had one of our first of a series of three at each of the station areas uh, just last month and we'll be having more this summer and fall. Uh, we've also created an interagency group that serves as a technical advisory committee. We we'll work very closely with technical staff, both from city of the, the city of Federal Way, uh, as well as the other jurisdictions and agencies along uh, the corridor, uh, WASHDOT, Federal Highways, uh, the Puyallup Tribe. Uh, as you're well aware, there are a lot of infrastructure projects currently taking place in South King and Pierce <coughs> counties, and we want to make sure that we are working collaboratively uh, with our regional partners as we all work to deliver our projects on time and on budget. Uh, we've also created an elected leadership group, uh, which is a model that was uh, really came to being during the Federal Way Link Extension process uh, that includes members of the Sound Transit Board uh, from South King and Pierce Counties, the mayors of the jurisdictions, a representative of the Puyallup Tribal Council, and also a representative from WashDOT. Uh, that really will serve as a steering committee for the project. Uh, Mayor Farrell serves as co-chair of that group. Uh, we'll meet uh, around six to eight times in the next year and help uh, provide feedback and guidance to the Sound Transit Board uh, as we go through the milestones of this project. We'll also be in uh, regular contact with council as well as the other uh, city councils along the corridor and the Puyallup <laughs> Tribe for uh, regular updates and be happy to answer questions anytime you have them uh, throughout the project. Uh, and at the very bottom we have our Sound Transit Board, uh, which all of this information and feedback will funnel back up to our board uh, as they will ultimately have the final decision uh, for the project to be built as we move forward. 
Uh, so we just completed uh, in the month of April and early May our early scoping process. And early scoping is an opportunity for the general public and as well as local agencies to give input on the route, uh, the alignment, and station location alternatives as we consider uh, the, the early phase of this project as we try to determine where's, what's our path forward. Uh, so throughout that month, we were looking for feedback on uh, how to identify potential routes and station locations, uh, comment on the evaluation criteria that Sound Transit will use to evaluate project alternatives, uh, as well as hear community feedback on the potential benefits, uh, both positive and negative, on the project uh, we'll have on the community and the environment. Uh, so we had that month-long process and had a very robust feedback and uh, just wanted to share some very early uh, metrics that we have and we'll be uh, sure to share some uh, more details in the comments of those are currently being compiled. Uh, but we held an early agency scoping meeting with all of our jurisdictions and partner agencies uh, in the South Sound. Uh, we had more than 24 people attend that meeting, uh, which was more than our West Seattle Ballard project had, a similar light rail project. Uh, we held uh, open houses in each of the station areas. Uh, we had 46 participants at our Fife open house, uh, 54 at our Federal Way open house. That was April 18th at Todd Beamer High School. Uh, a little over 90 folks at our Tacoma open house. Uh, we had nearly 50 participants in our station area workshops. And we also had an online open house, uh, which it presented the, uh, the exact information that we had in all three of these open houses, uh, where you could go in and see the project boards and also an interactive map of the project corridor. So if there was a citizen that had a idea or a comment, uh, whether they be positive or negative, they could place a pin on the map and leave their feedback. And all that was compiled into our early scoping comments. Um, in all, we had more than 2,400 unique visits to the online open house website and received 270 comments alone uh, through, through the web. Uh, and we, in all, we had over 540 comments that we received both from the public agencies uh, throughout the, that, that process, which is just the first of several comment periods that both uh, local jurisdictions and the general public will have uh, to uh, give their feedback throughout this project. And once we go moving forward, we will have regular lines of communication, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, we have a specific project email list, uh, tdlink at soundtransit.org, which is in the left column on your screen. Uh, we'll be having future open houses this fall, as well as in future phases of the project, uh, where the public can come and get uh, updates in person and see uh, the latest information. Uh, we also have a dedicated project web page at soundtransit.org slash tdlink, well, we will post regular updates. You can sign up for an email, a newsletter, as well as uh, copies of all the materials that we share uh, to the public and our open houses. Those will all be eventually uploaded online uh, so the citizens can check that out whenever they wish. Uh, we'll also be doing future surveys and social media updates as that was a very popular uh, engagement tool throughout this uh, first early scoping comment period. With that, that concludes our, our overview and presentation this evening. Uh, Sue and I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have about the project and, and the process. Deputy Mayor Hunter. Thank you. Thank you for being here tonight. I heard about the freeway and the accident on the freeway. It sounded like a mess. I have some questions. I, I have about three or four. One is um, earlier we had a discussion of the power lines that, lead, that you'll have to work your way around under or probably not above, but um, I was wondering how that process is coming, if you've figured that out yet. Um, sure. Um, no, we, we are still working on that. So that is uh, definitely going to be uh, a challenge. Um, uh, we have uh, the trains run on overhead power. Um, so there's they have their power lines, and then, of course, there's the BPA power lines. So, um, there needs to be a distance uh, between those p power lines um, and so that's the, the challenge that we have in um, deciding whether we're going to be on a bridge at that point, whether we're going to be possibly even slightly at, at grade or slightly below grade in order to um, get through there and or whether the power lines need to be raised. Anyway, there are many, many options and those that's some of the things that will be looked at in this early phase. We actually have a feasibility study to look specifically at that in the next um, year or so. Who pays the cost of if the power lines have to be elevated or do you guys, does Sound Transit pay that or? 
you, you know, it actually depends on what power lines we're talking about. So, um, you know, in some cases, uh, Sound Transit has paid, I mean, I'm thinking now throughout the region. Mm -hmm. So throughout the region where we've had to do this, in some cases, Sound Transit has paid. In other cases, um, the utility itself, uh, if they're in a public right of way, and they may have a franchise agreement with the city, in which case um, they, they have to pay, or sometimes there's a, a cost sharing that happens between Sound Transit and the utility. So it really depends on the individual utility and the circumstances where the lines are located and a number of other factors that actually involve, it's a, in some ways it's a legal issue as to the actual payments. Okay. And my um, two other questions are the um, operations and maintenance facility. I've been told that that's probably chosen first, that location, before the route, or is that true? I would not say that's necessarily chosen before the route, no. But it's one of the In first fact, things that are that's chosen. Pardon? It's one of the first things that's chosen? Um, well, we're, we're working, right now we're on the same time frame for uh, both um, the maintenance facility and the track and stations. And as I mentioned, we do have a goal of getting to a preferred alternative uh, next June. So we're doing some um, early work on the maintenance facility right now to try to do some additional studies over the summer to try to nail down uh, some a number of factors about the maintenance facility before we can determine, um, you know, the facility siting criteria, the schedule, and so forth. So that that's actually we'll know more uh, by the time early fall comes along about the maintenance facility. Uh, the the South Station and Federal Way on the map it looks like it's around the Costco area. How much? Uh, land do you need to build a station with a parking garage? A lot of that is still to be determined um, because there's the land for, the, there's the station platform itself and the platforms are about 400 feet long. Um, so they can support the four car trains. And uh, then we have some assumptions for a parking garage right now that we've used in the representative project. Yeah, right, um, and so that was a Hi, five hundred. This is Kathy. I'm just Sorry about that. Okay. Technical glitch. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, about five hundred stalls were being assumed in the representative project. So um, the representative project actually looked like the parking would uh, be. Uh, shared potentially if it if it goes in the parking lot there then then there could be some shared parking but we are actually looking very broadly at um, where should the station be and there's definitely no determination that that's the station location yet so that was what we asked during the early scoping and at the open houses and so forth was people to and at the stationary workshops we asked people to give us ideas about what would be a good place for the station and then we'll look at all those alternatives and rate them. <coughs> well, the, as you choose this, the site for the station, will the city have some input? Oh, absolutely. In so if, yes. as, if we don't think it's a good site, would you perhaps change your location if necessary? Yeah, well, we are, are hopeful. I mean, I guess this is what I say our goal is to have a consensus of the people on the elected leadership group uh, as to where the stations, where all four stations are located. So that, that's, you know, that's part of this process that, you know, Austin just described to you is, um, is to, try, to try to get early consensus on the preferred alternative is, is very important to us. I mean, it, it may not happen. Maybe there'll be a couple of sites that look equally good and, and it may be hard to determine which one is best um, by next June, but but that is uh, the goal that we have put out there. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, I've got uh, four lined up here. We've got uh, Council Member uh, Copang, Council Member Asefa Dawson. What's that? Uh, Council Member Asefa Dawson, then Council Member Duclo, then Council Member Martin Moore, then Council Member Copang. Thank you, and thank you for the presentation. And I do use um, light rail um, f 
from Angle Lake to, to um, UW every now and then. And the parking lot at Angle Lake fills up fast, though, but not as fast as Tukwila, I should say. My question is, um, you talked about the maintenance and facility, so trains stop between 1 and 5. As you extend and expand the, the, the distance all the way to Tacoma and Everett, people are going to commute longer and further. And so if, this, if the purpose of Sound Transit, one of the reasons is to alleviate traffic. So people who work late shifts, like second shift until 11, or start early, will not be able to use it. So is there any way or any consideration for staggering the cleaning maintenance so that at least you can extend the time and the hours of light rail? Otherwise, it does not serve the population that may need to use light rail. Um, well, did you want to help? Uh, well, just, yeah, we have actually we heard some comments like that, um, exactly what you're mentioning during this uh, outreach that we conducted during April. And, um, you know, I think one thing that the agency as a whole, as you mentioned, this is a system wide issue needs to be looking at our ridership in the future and, and looking ahead to how do we handle the many people that want to ride. And um, so I do think, um, you know, we, we actually have a, an analysis going on. I mentioned we're doing a lot of work this summer that I, I can't say it's going to answer that, but I think people are raising that issue as more and more people want to ride the light rail and how how is that accommodated um, you know are there for example I mean there's a lot of ways to do it are there buses that supplement where the light rail goes that's how we do it on sounder on the commuter rail we have buses that supplement because of course sounder only is really runs during the commute hours only and then there's buses that supplement the rest of the time um, but it's yeah it's, it's a, an important point and we can certainly take that back or you and make that one of your comments, so be fine. All right. Uh, Councilmember Duclo, then Councilmember Moore. Oh, um, I went to the meeting that was held not too long ago, and um, I had a particular question because of the, the route going through here and going through our business t uh, area down by Costco and all of that. And um, I believe I was told that it would not interfere with those stores, that it would be up further between the stores and I-5. Is that still the case? Well, the, the representative project is uh, is shown between the stores and I-5. But I, I you know, ultimately, uh, that's one of the things we'll be looking at is are there properties that are impacted or uh, properties that are displaced as a result of some of the alternatives that people are uh, asking us to take a look at. Yeah, I know. But for the city, that would if they're displaced, that means a loss of revenue for right, us. Right, right. So that would be one of the concerns of one of the negative yeah. uh, impacts that we need to look I just, I'm going to keep hitting that yeah, point. Yeah. So you hey, guys don't Duke, that, I think that's the great, uh, sorry to cut you off, I'm sorry, but that's I think one of the great benefits. I'm the co-chair of this and that's something that I am watching very, very closely. I'll report back to this group, but I'm, I've got my eye on that ball as well. It's very, very important. You know, imagine, you know, if, if they clipped uh, out the, the Costco, yeah. you know, what, and, what, and, the, other stores there. and the, other, the other locations there, the Home Depot as well. And, it is it is exactly so and I, and, I, and I would just like to add whether that's through the elected leadership group as mayor Farrell mentioned uh, through our interagency group working very closely with city staff as we have this uh, engagement process in this various groups these are the types of concerns and challenges that we'd like to to work together and identify early in the process uh, so we can try to reach that consensus and address as many of those as we can uh, early in the project so we're, we're very excited to work with the city uh, collaboratively so we can try to address those. Concerns. it would be nice for the council to know more about what goes on with the meetings you bet yeah. and I'm gonna have EJ with me as well so we're uh, he and I've been attending these meetings and and so we'll keep you posted all right, Councilor Copang. Uh, yeah, regarding the, uh, the maintenance facility, um, what is the size requirement for the <coughs> facility? Right, well, well, that's one of the things we're looking at this summer is exactly wh what is the size that we need because we need to figure out how many um, trains we need for the service and how many trains we need to store at this south maintenance facility. And we also need to look at um, whether the maintenance facility needs to do what we call heavy maintenance which is basically all the maintenance on the trains 
Um, for example, right now the central maintenance facility does the heavy maintenance, meaning they can do basically any kind of maintenance that's uh, long-term maintenance that's needed on all the equipment. Whereas our east maintenance facility that's uh, under construction in Bellevue, that is a little bit lighter. There are some functions that cannot be performed over there, so they'll need to bring the trains over to the Seattle facility in order to, uh, to do that type of maintenance. So those things are being determined now as the one in the south need to be that heavy maintenance facility as well. And um, how many trains does it need to store? And then once we know that, we can start looking at the size. In general terms, we've been telling people it's likely that it will be um, somewhat similar to the one in Seattle, which is about 28 acres or so, 28 to 30 acres. Um, but uh, we really need to know the key, the key, honestly, is the number of trains. And until we need to know the number of vehicles that we need to store, that will determine how many tracks and how, how big it needs to be. So um, we hope to have more information on that, like I said, by early, early fall. Okay. I think uh, there's obviously a limited amount of tracks of land that would meet that size requirement. So I think as far as sensitivity to I think there's a number of things I think in the potential of fitting that in somewhere along the south end the environment obviously is a very important um, to I think all of us certainly uh, um, but I know it's a very sensitive issue for a number of community members here and uh, has been vocally expressed it's been a very important issue so something to keep in mind I also think that uh, existing zoning is uh, very important I think to displace residential communities um, should, would not be desirable but uh, again I think um, you guys are early enough in the process certainly understand there's a lot of details that you can't um, can't really share because they have not been determined yet um, but that being said I just would like us to make sure that we are really considering um, both the environment and the existing zoning in that process so we uh, have as, as little of an impact as possible on the community Yes, um, and on the environment. yes okay. we will definitely be building those into our evaluation criteria yeah I, I, I knew you would be but uh, again I think it's important to yeah. thank express you. that thank, thank you. you thank you okay <clears throat> council any other questions all right thank you very much for your presentation thank you again for the opportunity and we are always here to be a resource for you if there's any time that we can help answer questions uh, please feel free to reach out anytime we'd be happy to to come back and maybe to provide updates throughout the project so thank very you again good. for the opportunity very good thank you very much um ej anything for the good of the order all right this is on their council questions but also discussion uh certainly we have heard uh the uh, concerns uh, as expressed in regard to our, our business community and making sure that you know we protect those revenue uh, tr protect those businesses and and do everything we can and we will but is there any other general discussion um, as it relates to this topic uh, councilmember Savadas I think it's around uh, budget I know we've already voted on it and it's passed and are you coming back to the public to, for more dollars as time continues or what uh, I just want um, to understand it better Oh, good question yeah can you talk about you know uh, obviously uh, uh, st3 passed yeah. and what does that mean in regard to um, you know the duration of this and and, uh, and I know there's likely some uh, bills done in Olympia that have dealt with mm -hmm. blue book value versus yes. other valuation streams and I think there's some you know some action regarding that can you yeah absolutely uh, that's a, it's a great question and it's something that our board and our agency takes a very close look at uh, throughout the lifeline of our projects uh, as the mayor alluded to there has been a lot of discussion in Olympia and also discussion in, in Washington DC with some of our funding sources uh, you know in terms of what would the voters have approved those those cost estimates are our starting point through the project uh, there are certain factors that do uh, account for potential escalations uh, but in terms of possible changes Changes that are beyond the agency's control in Olympia or elsewhere uh, those are things that the sound transit board will watch very closely if there are any things that would impact our financial plan is up to our board uh, to look at those and what the impact would be and how to move forward uh, but we are certainly uh, committed to delivering those projects uh, and regardless of the financial challenges that would be up to our board to best determine of how to pro proceed but uh, the, the we have the the voter approved funding is what we have moving forward can I ask a Please. So my concern is if funding's if funding is depleted or shortage, mm -hmm. 
you have several projects that are ST3s mm -hmm. running at the same time, right? Being uh, constructed, whatever. So my concern is you would prioritize or Sound Transit could prioritize who gets first choice or whatever rather than us or Bellevue or whoever, you know, all the ST3s is what I'm talking about. So yep. how do you even decide who gets the deliverables should there be a shortfall in funding? Well, there's a shortfall in funding that's up to our Sound Transit board. But one factor in financing of all of our Sound Transit project is that we have a sub-area equity policy and that our district is divided into five sub-areas of which King County is divided into three, uh, north, east, and south. And when the agency was created in the 1990s, that policy uh, dictated that revenue generated in the sub areas uh, could only be spent on projects that benefit the sub area. Uh, so for instance, in the, the project that Sue alluded to uh, in Bellevue with the maintenance facility, South King County dollars are not being sp used for Bellevue projects or Everett projects. Uh, those dollars are being spent on projects that go into South, that benefit South King County. So when we talk about the, the project uh, the many projects that you mentioned in Sound Transit 3 over the next 20 to 25 years, uh, that staggering takes into account the revenue that is generated in each of those sub areas. Uh, but we are committed to deliver the projects. Uh, if there are uh, you know, certain changes in Olympia or Washington, D.C., or the, uh, any economic changes, are, that's up to our board of directors to evaluate our financial plan and the impacts uh, to the budget or the timeline of those projects. Councilor Duclo? Yeah, I just, I just want to remain. Uh remind everybody that uh, you know there there are deadlines here and there there are goals I will also remind people that if you run if you run over budget um, somebody has to pay for that and and uh, and I hope when you finish this project you don't throw a million dollar party on taxpayers money right. <laughs> uh, Council Member Austin, do you have anything else I think that brings me back to my point then with this sub area equity policy it, it's it makes sense in a way but considering that South County is um, serves a lot of people who are low and moderate income the equity part then is not going to come into play right Councilmember Savada you took the words right out of my mouth and I think that 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 I think Really, when my, I served on the Metro Guidelines Committee, uh, account, uh, uh, Executive Constantine appointed me to uh, to that board in regard to Metro service and the addition of certain lines. And I think uh, that was one of the things about social equity and regional equity. And I, I was actually just, you know, no sooner had you said that than I was thinking of the same thing that, that you know, and I, you know, what, what occurred actually with ST2 um, you know, long before uh, you guys were, were coming before us, was based on sub area equity, what would, had been promised to us, which was a station delivered to 272nd, was pulled back to 240th based on a lack of revenue, based on sub area equity. Um, and, and that wasn't equity. Uh, that was the fact that other areas of the county had more income stream and therefore they got more product. But the whole goal. Of, of this is not only to move people up on the, the, the to move people up and down the spot what they refer to as the spine of, of sound transit but also to provide some some regional equity so people can can access this uh, and and get out of their cars and so I, I would certainly hope is there is there consideration for that in the sub area equity or if we run into a situation here is there an appealable part uh, of that because I I think that is that goes to the very heart of equity you know that that's a, I think it's a great question I can't answer with certainty this evening but I can certainly go back and get that answer but that's it's a, th those are the types of issues that that would fall back to our board on how to to handle any potential impact to the financial plan but I can see what information we might be able to, to get on that there were some really hard feelings uh, a number of years ago uh, when when st2 got pulled back mm -hmm. um, to 240th and yeah. so I, and it and ultimately it comes down to tra and I and I you guys are, are great representatives you're, you're providing this but if you could relay that to your folks at yes, sir. Uh, and I'll relay it to our uh, sound transit representative yes. our King County Councilman mm -hmm. people on Reichbauer but that boy that's something to really mm -hmm. keep an eye on 
Uh, Council Member um, uh, Moore. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. You know, um, Austin and, and Sue, I, I do appreciate you coming here. You're, you're, certainly, you're certainly a new face mm -hmm. uh, to, to myself and potentially my colleagues. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I really appreciate um, what Council Member Safadassan is, is talking mm -hmm. about. And I'm, I'm really hoping you're taking that to heart. Mm -hmm. uh, and I really am going to be looking for an email. Uh, to come into my inbox as to a response to that question. Mm -hmm. uh, and I do appreciate what Mayor Farrell's doing. I, I was not going to talk, but I really feel like this is a really important topic, um, Austin. Mm -hmm. And um, I sure hope and I'm confident that you've done your homework mm -hmm. on Federal Way and mm -hmm. Sound Transit. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you've done your homework, you'll know that Federal Way never supported uh, sound transit measures, to be mm -hmm. to be quite blunt. Mm -hmm. I know we've kind of alluded to it a little bit. Uh, so um, so I really hope that you're moving forward with that notion in mind because uh, I think it's fair to say that there's some concerns mm -hmm. still. Uh, and, uh, and I'm a person that shares in those concerns, mm -hmm. but I see the value in mass transit. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it's what helps working families move mm -hmm. uh, from one end to the other and to get to their jobs. Yes. Uh, and so, you know, I want to be clear that I, I support mass transit and I think it's it's a valuable part to making families stronger. Yes. Uh, but y y you need to know uh, that there are a lot of concerns. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I will end my comment, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. No. All right. Count Thank you, Council Member uh, for that spot on uh, question. Okay, so uh, if we could get maybe some clarification, yeah, I think that's yes, the takeaway. And, and maybe uh, you know, just let uh, uh, Mr. Rogoff know of the mm -hmm. uh, pleas of the, you know, the, the sensitivity. Yes, I will, make, I will make sure to. And it's that we are committed uh, to being a collaborative and a good community partner. So we recognize there is substantial investment coming to the Federal Way community, and we want to be a good community partner throughout that process. And Mr. Uh, Councilmember Moore. And Austin, you've said that dozens of times, and I, I appreciate hearing that. Uh, it's the action that's going to be really important. Yeah, absolutely. So and if there's thanks. other, so we would welcome council uh, suggestions or city staff suggestions as we've received those throughout this process and how we can engage with the public and engage with groups. We would certainly value that feedback as, as we move forward in our community engagement. Okay. One, one, one thing, it's not just engaging, it's actually following up on what you say you're going to do for people. Well, yes. that's, where yep. fell, that's where it's fallen down in the past. That's all right. Okay. Well, thank you so much. This is uh, this is the beginning. You know, we're just in the beginning stages here, but uh, I will I will make sure or we will all make sure that the council's kept in the loop on this. And uh, anything else for the good of the order? Anyone else for discussion? All right. Uh, thank you very much for a very productive presentation. Thank you really, very much it. appreciate it. Uh, with that, uh, our study session has come to a close. We'll be in recess uh, until 7 p.m. when the regular council meeting begins.